Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 211. This week the questions are taken from the Wednesday video on Admiral Lee, the ultimate sharpshooter, and on guide 255 to the Japanese Navy carrier Kaga. Let's begin. Mihai asks, what is the actual relationship between a captain and an admiral on his ship? I've seen some of your videos that some captains can overrule admirals, as happened on the Bismarck or during the Guadalcanal campaigns, but in Admiral Lee's case, the admiral was working with the officers aboard the ship and changing the way that certain elements operate, in Admiral Lee's case, the guns. Was this common, or are these isolated incidences? The answer is very, very variable. I mean, the, obviously there are certain differences in various navies, uh, in that in terms of that relationship. It can also depend on the relative seniority of both officers involved. So, for example, you know, I mean, you don't get to command a battleship or any kind of large vessel without a fair bit of experience, but you could be a captain for whom being assigned to this cruiser or this battleship is your first such assignment. So you might only have a few months of such command under your belt, or you might be a captain who's themselves on the verge of being promoted to flag rank and you might have half a decade of such command under your belt and likewise you might have um, a rear admiral who only got his his star you know, that summer or you might have a full admiral who has again been doing this for half a decade or more so you you can have complete extremes you could have a captain who is maybe seniority wise only six months to a year behind the admiral that is aboard his ship or you could have a captain who is 10 to 15 years uh, with, uh, with a seniority gap bit, bit with the admiral on the ship that's obviously going to massively affect the dynamic between the two um, personality also a huge factor um, and various expertise so obviously admiral lee was known by this point to be a very very good gunnery officer at which point, given his personality and his expertise, then, you know, when he gets aboard Washington, the captain's not really going to have too many problems, assuming the captain's a reasonable individual, with a with one of the fleet's best gunnery experts getting his ship better at gunnery. There's also the matter of how large a force the Admiral has to command, because obviously, theoretically, the Admiral is there to command a larger uh, group and the captain is there to be master of his ship and you know in in say Bismarck's case initially there were two ships so you know and one was following the other so there whilst there was an overall command for the admiral to get involved in it wasn't exactly the world's most taxing <laughs> um, but then you might have situations where an admiral might be in on, with the captain and m that might be the only ship that's actually available um you know the only ship that both of them actually have under their command at that point because there might be a shortage of ships as there was in the area around the Guadalcanal campaign until they could scrape together South Dakota and four random destroyers for Admiral Lee to command or it might be a a, a short circumstance so you know it might be a captain and an admiral on a ship that's designed to be a flagship which is being sent out but you know from the point it leaves port to the point it arrives in the operational area there may not be any other ships accompanying it or it may be that various ships have been lost so you know the second half of Bismarck's voyage once Prince Eugen has broken off there's no other ship to command and so if the admiral has the larger strategic picture to consider and you know two dozen other ships to worry about then the relationship between him and the captain of his ship is going to be a much more distant and formal one than it is if there's only two or three other ships or no other ships. In general, however, the Admiral is the master of the strategy. So the Admiral can decide where the ship is going in broad terms. We're sailing to here, we're going to fight over here, etc. The captain is the master of the ship itself. So how the ship gets from point A to point B in fine detail, whether or not you're taking evasive action while you're under air attack, um, what the day-to-day -day orders of the ship are, how the ship's actually fighting in battle, all of that is, generally speaking, down to the captain. Although, as I said, there are some variations between different navies because, obviously, ultimately, the Admiral is the senior officer, but 
the convention in most navies is that the admiral does not take precedence over the captain when the ship is in action. This can be different, as I said, obviously, if if the if different navies have different policies, or if there is an understanding between the admiral and the captain in particular circumstances. Edward Dunn asks, you mentioned in this video that Admiral Lee couldn't head south as the reports of Tappy 3 came in without committing gross insubordination. However, you also mentioned that Admiral Lee frequently went behind Admiral King and Buord's backs without their knowledge. Where is dash was the line for gross insubordination drawn and how loose were the boundaries on it? For example, would they be tighter in wartime or battle as compared to peacetime or out of battle? Certainly the lines in peacetime can be a lot stricter than they are in wartime. Indeed, uh, for quite a long period of time, I don't know if this is carried forward into all navies in the current era, but certainly for long periods of history, there were actual separate rules governing navies in times of peace and times of war. And, you know, therefore the rules would quite literally be changed. But in regards to approximately say world war ii using admiral lee as partially as an example it, it is not a defined line strictly i mean theoretically you could look in a in one of the rule books and see okay this is what gross insubordination is defined as but as with most rules and regulations you can rules lawyer your way around a, a fair bit of it and a lot of the time it it comes down to a mixture of what they know won't hurt them um, and, you know, nothing breeds permission like success. And I know they're two very trite terms, but they do, you know, really hold true. With Taffy 3 and that whole situation, Admiral Lee had been given orders by Halsey and, you know, he was supposed to escort Halsey's forces. He was supposed to be leading them into action he had a job to protect the carriers and it was very cut and dried. This is what you are ordered to do. There was, there's no wiggle room on that. So for him to then just do a 180 and sail off in the other direction, there's nothing to justify that in terms of, you know, what, how did you interpret your orders to allow you to do this? It's, it's just not there. The orders are the orders and such is life. Whereas in a lot of other cases where you can get away with something that might be considered gross insubordination in other circumstances, well, as I said, you know, if someone's issued a bunch of orders, but a circumstance comes up that is not strictly covered by those orders, now you might think, oh, well, you know, if I asked them, they would probably say this. And if you did ask them and they did say that, then that becomes an order and you now, well, assuming it's worded correctly, you can't get out of it. But if you, you know, think, OK, well, this is a situation they didn't cover, but I'm going to try and solve it without asking for further orders. This is where the success failure thing comes in, because... Uh, I don't know if you've watched the Disney version of The Prince and the Pauper, um, but, you know, if let's say there is an issue and um with gun the ship's guns and admiral lee could say right well i could communicate with the bureau of ordnance and ask them about it and then they'll probably say this and i won't agree with that so i'm not going to ask them about it i'm going to do my own thing i'm going to fix it and then i'm going to tell them by the way there was this problem this is how i fixed it then in almost all circumstances this holds true in civilian life as much as it does in military in most circumstances, the superior officer will then turn around and go, that's an excellent idea, I'm glad I thought of it, and quietly take the credit. Because, you know, obviously, it, this was the right way of doing things, and obviously, if you had asked me, then uh, that's exactly what I would have said. And since you've done what I would have said, then we're all good. Fantastic. And everyone goes on and quietly pretends that that's actually somewhat close to reality. Whereas, if there's this area where theoretically maybe you should have asked for orders first and you completely stuff it up then you can really be in trouble because then people are like, well, why did you go and do that you know if you'd asked me i would not have told you to go and do that and you should have asked me and now you've gone and lost us a ship and now we're all very angry with you and similarly it also comes down to how you interpret orders because you know with 
as we said with Admiral Halsey, the orders were fairly strict. There was no real wiggle room on it, it's certainly in relation to something like turning around and going back to rescue Tappy 3. But other times, either deliberately, uh, higher officers might issue orders that are a little bit vague, which allow for a lot of interpretation, or they might issue a series of stacked orders, basically trying to micromanage things, which kind of follow an if-then-else scenario, but quite often follow just an if-then series. And some of the more inventive officers in wartime have realised that that means that all subsequent orders down that chain are reliant on some of the earlier sections. And if some of those earlier sections no longer apply because the situation isn't as high command thought it was going to be or perhaps it was when those orders were issued but now thanks to the enemy those that situation has changed quite dra dramatically then the rest of that chain theoretically falls apart and therefore you can start interpreting things in other ways there so i think at one point i can't remember offhand but there was a, a royal navy ship in the mediterranean that had a, almost exactly this issue the orders were to pick up these th things here and take them all the way across to, to either Malta or Gibraltar or somewhere in the Western Mediterranean and then do this, this and this and then come back. Basically uh, a very micromanaged supply res re resupply run. Except that partway along um, they got word that that first bit picking up things they were supposed to be transporting was no longer going to be possible i can't remember it was the, i think the ship that they were supposed to take things from or the ship they were supposed to be escorting had been sunk and there was a bunch of action going on nearby and so the captain went well all of our orders are predicated on this first thing this first thing is no longer possible so technically we could follow our orders and sail all the way across the mediterranean and come back again but with nothing actually productive to show for it or we could just split off and go and shoot up some of the enemy and again in theory with the failure of that first section of orders he should have radioed back and gone hang on this isn't possible anymore what else do you want me to do but instead he just went nope stuff it we're going off and, and fighting the enemy did a fairly good job of it and then when he got back kind of looped back to what we were saying earlier about success is the best way of getting permission because the admirals kind of looked and went well yeah we couldn't follow your original orders we could have used you over here but you did a pretty good job over there so um yeah just just ask us next time you don't technically have any strict orders as to what you're supposed to be doing so yeah it's kind of a long form way of saying that outside of very specific circumstances there is a fair bit of wiggle room if you know how to play your command style. Strix asks, how common is it for promotions in the Navy to be backtraced to a certain earlier time point? So backdated or retroactive promotions are something that comes and goes. So these days it's not quite as common, although there is still legislation on the books in most navies for officers to apply for retroactive promotion. But back in the old days it was actually quite important in it exists in kind of a space between the really old school age of sale method of promotion which was usually dependent on simple seniority i.e um you know this guy has been in service with the navy for x years you've been in the navy for you know, 10 days less than that so he gets promoted first uh, so once that system was kind of done away with but before the more modern processing systems came into place there there was a reasonable degree of retroactive promotion but it depended on what you were doing because again depending on the various navies but usually there'd be some kind of promotion board which would sit to decide whether or not you were you know worthy of being promoted and they'd look at your performance and if they judged that you were uh, worthy of being promoted then all well and good but as certain navies went through significant expansion periods the a number of people available to sit on the promotion boards and the number of times those promotion boards sat could be cons they, you know they could end up with a backlog of data and you know the navy itself might not be growing substantially at the time but it might have grown substantially around about the time that that particular officer was coming into service so there'd be a glut of people um, all of a similar date of it coming into service who would be eligible for promotion to a certain level and why all of that matters is 
seniority was still a thing. It, to do a certain degree, it still is. Um, but certainly back in the early part of the 20th century, if you had two people of the same rank, whether they be captains, rear admirals, commodores, whatever, in a formation, then barring explicit orders one way or the other, command of the overall group would go to the one who had the greater seniority, i.e. they'd been promoted to that rank even if it was a matter of days or weeks before the other officer. And especially in the first half of the first half of the 20th century, i.e. the 1900s, 1910s and 1920s-ish, um, another of the bigger problems was some navies liked to actually have correspondence or interviews with officers um, before they made the decision to promote, which was all well and good if the officer was in the country, but if the officer was on the other side of the ocean on a long-term assignment, then, yeah, getting hold of them might be somewhat difficult, or even just getting hold of correspondence or recommendations and references. So a board might sit and go, right, OK, on such and such a day, we think that uh, this officer's probably eligible for promotion to the next rank. But if they're looking for evidence and the evidence is, well, you know, his former commanding officer is now, let's say we're using the US Navy so admirally as an example. So the board meets like, oh, well, you know, his commanding officer, former commanding officer is over in Europe. So we're going to have to write to them. Um, and a couple of other former commanding officers are now retired. So we'll have to write to them. And Lee himself, you know, he's over in the far side of the Pacific. So we have to send something to him. And uh, where on earth was his loss? But one commanding officer, have we lost him? Oh, no, he's off doing some kind of ambassadorial role in the Indian Ocean. We should probably talk to him as well. And as compared to, you know, Captain Joe Bloggs' administrative arm of the US Navy, well, he, he's three, three corridors and two offices down, and his current and former commanding officers are one level up so that you know you could go and ask them have the decision made in a week but once you've collated all the relevant information and made the decision for someone like at the time say captain lee it might be months possibly even in up to a year since he was actually eligible for that rank and because seniority is such an important thing you pretty much to maintain morale for people had to backdate that promotion because if you didn't then you would be unfairly penalizing officers who were just out on long-term assignments away from the continental united states or even officers who might be in the continental united states but whose former commanding officers might be off doing something and so uh, you, you backdate that both their seniority and that comes with a bunch of backdated pay as well in order to ensure that the relative seniority of various officers has been maintained. Because obviously if Admiral Lee, or uh, Captain Lee, Lieutenant Lee, whatever rank he is at the, that time, if his conduct and actions have merited that he should be a Lieutenant com Commander, Captain, Rear Admiral, etc., as soon as he is eligible, then he should have that rank from that point, regardless of if that actual board decision confirming that is six months late. Brandon Shermer asks, You decry Bismarck often for its inefficiency, but what are some examples of a particularly efficient ship, either in a highly capable ship for its displacement, or one that was far easier to construct than would be suggested by displacement alone? In terms of particular efficiency for displacement, because a ship that's easier to construct than would be suggested by displacement alone doesn't necessarily have to be an efficient ship it's just one that's easy to build um, but for displacement i've said before the south dakota class because you know actually manages to get decent protection reasonable speed and good firepower on thirty-five thousand tons thus proving you can actually do that um, without too many compromises obviously the compromise on the south dakotas was they're very full um there's not a lot of additional space left compared to most other ships. Um, the Richelieu's in some ways also occupy that kind of space because whilst there are one or two compromises with the Richelieu design, and of course 815s versus 916s before you go into you know, muzzle velocity and penetration, etc., is a slightly less uh, lesser armament than the South Dakotas, but it's still a very good armament. 
and you know Rishilia again proving that you can get good armament, decent protection, and very good speed on about thirty-five thousand tons. Uh, keeping with the French Navy, obviously the Algerie, as I said before, it point it sort of kind of exemplifies. Yeah, you can just admittedly, but you can get a ten thousand ton treaty cruiser that has again speed protection and firepower in all aspects. I'd also put things like the Rodney and well Nelson, I should say, and Brooklyn classes into that category. Um, the Nelsons, for again pointing out, you can get nine sixteen inch guns, good protection, and pretty decent speed for the early nineteen twenties. Again, actually under thirty five thousand tons, as it all turns out. Albeit that perhaps uh, some of that slight underweight could have been reallocated to you know actually making the turret systems not awful, um, but the Brooklyn class as well, kind of pointing out that unlike the Japanese, you can actually get 15 six-inch guns onto a treaty-era-like cruiser without breaking the treaty limits. Unryu Maru 20 asks, why did the US six-inch Mark 16 gun have a lower muzzle velocity, about 2,500 feet per second, as compared to the contemporary British six-inch Mark 23 at 2,760 FPS, and the Japanese 6.1 Type 3 at 3,000 plus FPS? Was it because the 2500 feet per second was the optimal velocity for the use of its super heavy AP shells, or would it have been better if the Mark 16 had a higher muzzle velocity? Okay, so first thing, I would hesitate to describe the United States Navy's 6 inch shells, as used in the Mark 16, as super heavy. Granted, they are on the upper end of weights for 6 inch shells of contemporary guns, but they're, they're not anything alike proportionally as heavy as some of the other confirmed super heavy shells. So if you compare the 16 inch shells in Nelson, which is notoriously lightweight, and the 16 inch shells in Nagato to the 16 inch shells in the Iowas, the super heavies, well, Nelson shells are about 76% the weight of Iowas, and Nagato shells are about just under 82% the weight of Iowa's, which between, if you average it out, it means that compared to other contemporary, well, not contemporary because both those are early 1920s, but other in-service 16-inch guns at the time, the US Super Heavy shell um, is considerably heavier. The others average out about 79% the weight of a Super Heavy US shell. And with the 8-inch gun, um, again, if you look at the modern Japanese 8-inch guns in service in World War II, compared to the US Super Heavy 8-inch shell, the Japanese shell is 82.5-ish percent as heavy. The British shell is 76.5 percent as heavy, and averaged out, they're 79.5 percent as heavy as a US Super Heavy shell. So, you know, there's just over 30 percent difference. That's comfortably a Super Heavy shell. But when you look at the 6-inch shells, the Japanese have the lighter shell at 112 pounds. The Americans, as I said, have the heavier shell at 130, but the British shell is 123.2. So that means that the Japanese shell, although it's by far the lightest of the three, is still 86% the weight of the US shell, and the British shell is 95% the weight of the US shell. And averaged out comes out at 90.5% for everybody else, averaged weight compared to the US. Now, given that that's under 10% margin, and particularly with the British shell that's just a fraction over 5% margin, as compared to the 20%, uh, I misspoke earlier, it's 20, just over 20% margin that the US shells have at the 8-inch and 16-inch range, I, I would not call the US 6-inch shell a super heavy shell. It's just a slightly heavier than average shell. Regardless, however... For one thing, the Mark 16 gun is the shortest of the three. So the Mark 16 is a 47 caliber gun, the British gun is a 50 caliber weapon, so three calibers longer, and the Japanese is a 60 caliber weapon. So assuming everything else was equal, you would expect the US gun to be the have the slowest muzzle velocity because it's the shortest barrel. Now, when it comes to propellant charges, the US shell has a slightly heavier propellant charge than the British, so it carries 33 pounds of propellant uh, per 
full charge as compared to the British £30 without going into the chemical composition differences of different propellants and how that might affect things slightly. Uh, there's not enough time in a dry dock answer to go through that. But suffice to say, the Japanese charge is £43, um, which coupled with the fact that the Japanese, as we said, had the lightest shell, it shouldn't come as too much of a surprise that the Japanese shell moves at, relatively speaking, warp speed. Now, when while the British charge is slightly smaller, obviously its shell is slightly lighter, but when you work out proportionally, it actually comes out that with a 33 pound charge, the US shell actually ha does have a fraction more propellant behind every pound of its shell than the British sh uh, shell does. So technically speaking, if you were to fire a British and an American shell out of the same gun using the same propellant charge, the American shell should go just a fraction faster out of the muzzle. But, of course, as we said, the British gun is a slightly longer gun, which is almost certainly making up most of the difference and more. And then you kind of factor in, finally, the fact that, as I said, the propellant itself is slightly different, and will have slightly different power, etc. And you basically end up with your overall result as to why the different muzzle velocities are as they are. And also shows you, um, apart from you know the Japanese going a bit nuts with the amount of propellant charge they stuck behind their gun, it also shows you just how much of a difference the different caliber lengths of the gun can actually make. UNSC Forward Onto Dawn asks, the 8-inch armed Karga versus the 8-inch armed Lexington, who wins the surface engagement? The answer is almost certainly going to be Lexington. Um, Whilst they have generally similar numbers of 8-inch guns, Lexington can bring all of her guns to bear at once. They're all mounted in turrets, whereas Cargo is split between turrets and casemates. And Lexington's are much more centrally positioned, which makes their fire much more likely to be accurate, as opposed to uh, Cargo, if it's pitching, one set of guns are going to have a significant difference in height to the other, and that's going to reverse as the ship pitches the other way and so forth. It's somewhat less likely to happen on Lexington. Plus, weirdly enough, was you know talking about armour belts on carriers, but Lexington does actually have a slightly better armour layout than Karga. Now, actually, while both ships' belt armour might actually stand a semi-decent chance of defeating an 8-inch shell at long range, Lexington's has a better chance, so Lexington will have a better immune zone against Karga's guns than vice versa. As again, as strange as that might sound to discuss, but you know, their aircraft carriers there's a lot more above the armor belt to shoot up. At which point, you know, fire control systems aside, assuming that they're equal for the sake of balance, but Lexington can put far more shells down range far more accurately without factoring in fire control differences than Cargo Cat, and therefore it's going to get more hits, which means it's going to almost certainly win the engagement. Jeff Tam asks, Japanese carriers have side funnels whilst the US has straight funnels next to the island. What is the idea between the two different designs and the pros and cons of each? Which design would you prefer? So the idea behind the different designs is all to do with making sure that the smoke in and the turbulence resulting from the hot efflux from the boilers is not interfering with your flight operations. With the more vertical element built into an island, like you see on US and most, though not all, British carrier designs, the idea is that you take the smoke and instead of just venting it up through a funnel amidships like you would do on a normal ship, you trunk it slightly sideways and then usually the funnels are quite tall because you want to get that hot air and smoke as high up away from the flight deck as possible and then let nature do the rest which means that your pilots, if they're coming in on the right approach, should, in theory, be able to fly underneath it. Um, they might fly through the uh, bit of smoke or whatever on their way to their flight approach, but the flight approach itself should take place underneath that um, disruptive air layer. With the Japanese approach, the idea is that by catapulting everything down and sideways, the air on the flight deck and above the flight deck is completely clear because there is no hopefully hot air or smoke efflux being generated because it's all being thrown down and sideways. Now obviously it will rise again but the uh, hopefully with the horizontal momentum you've imparted by the time it rises again it will be well offline for carrier landing approaches. <laughs> 
Now, it should be noted that prior to the installation of the system that we see in World War II, Karga had a system similar to Furious, where everything was ducted out the back. Uh, that wasn't a good plan, uh, because everything just rose up into the flight path of incoming aircraft, even if the flight deck itself was relatively clear. In theory, the downward turning funnel also offers a degree, potentially, of stealth, in that by exhausting all your hot gases and smoke into, well, down towards, not into the sea, it might cool some of it, so it will either stay low or rise slower, which may conceal your funnel smoke a bit better. But all in all, they're a bit more complicated to do, there's more curves involved, and also they do have the two potential issues, one of which is if the ship... Um, is hit, damaged, it begins to list, that it can cause issues. Um, so they had to build in extra features for, for that on the downward turning funnels. And the other element is, of course, that this assumes that the ship can maintain a direct um, course into the wind for flight operations, which may not be the case. And if in combat conditions isn't the case and you get a wind coming in from the starboard side because the uh, exhaust gases have can run down the length of the ship um, below the level of flight deck it means the wind could pick these up and push them back across the flight deck which could be a problem whereas if you have funnels that are sufficiently high above the flight deck it doesn't actually matter which way the wind is going as far as smoke and gas disruption is concerned because it's all happening way above the flight deck anyway so for the sake of simplicity and um, some niche case survivability and improved flight ops capacity i just go with the vertical funnels there's a reason they stuck around and were adopted by almost everybody else thereafter josh thomas moore asks how did the wooden fins on japanese torpedo bombers torpedoes help them from burying themselves in the seafloor at pearl harbor and did they keep using this idea or were they a one-time only thing so this requires a couple of different points of explanation. Firstly is that to men it's just to mention that the Japanese did not copy this system from the British. The British used a completely different method of ensuring the torpedoes didn't go too deep at Taranto. Secondly is that you know the fundamental issue which you hinted at is that if you drop a torpedo it's a couple of tons dropping from the sky at 100 plus miles an hour. Um, when it hits the surface of the water, it doesn't really actually care for a while. It just keeps going um, down and down and down, and then eventually it'll start to rise. This is why it's difficult to use in shallow attack scenarios like harbours. And so, therefore, the modifications the Japanese made for dropping torpedoes at Pearl Harbour as a whole were not consistently kept around in other scenarios because, well, they it wasn't necessary. But some of elements were, and uh, you see you know, shrouds of various descriptions fitted to other people's torpedoes, including Mark 13s toward the end of the war. However, this comes into the uh, the second part. It's relatively often stated that these things you can see in the picture, wooden tail fins essentially, are what uh, prevented the torpedoes from going too deep. And the idea is basically they prevent generally that they provided some kind of resistance and changed the angle of the torpedo slightly. Therefore, it, when it hit the water, it wasn't going to go as deep anyway, and there would be a resistance that would pull it up short, and then it, because it doesn't have as much momentum, it won't plunge down as far, etc., etc. Now, that's the general consensus. However, I was re relatively recently reading an article by a chap called Ray Panko. You can find it on the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum website, under the title Thunderfish in the Sky, and he actually makes a couple of interesting points, um, one of which is that the modification to attach these um, wooden fins on the back of the Japanese aerial torpedoes has a Type 97 marker, which actually means it's a late 1930s development, which doesn't fit with the other narratives that you have from pilots and other people associated with the Pearl Harbor attack, that the changes made to the torpedoes were very relatively speaking, last minute in order to allow them to run deep. And indeed, he then points out there's testing that post-dates a year appropriate for a Type 97 marker, 
wherein the torpedoes are still running too deep. Um, they're not running as deep, but they are running too deep to um, be viable in a harbour attack scenario. He then goes on to point out that actually what these tail end extensions mostly do is they stabilise the torpedo in flight through the air, which is why they can break off once they hit the water because they're no longer needed. Because, of course, air is a thousand times less dense than water, approximately speaking, and so the little um, control surfaces that you can see on the actual torpedo, which are perfectly fine for guiding the torpedo through the water, have basically next to no effect in the air. So you need a larger control surface to stop the torpedo yawing and oscillating and basically ensure that when you drop the torpedo it keeps going in the direction you want it to go, uh, which makes it somewhat more accurate. But for the actual depth control element, what he points out is that when you look through both the technical mission reports, that's the US Navy technical mission reports from the end of the war, and Japanese accounts from in internally uh, from 1940-41, and then with that in mind you reread the statements by the various pilots who were at Pearl Harbor, what you realize is there's actually a second feature that most people miss, which is that Japanese aerial torpedoes also have a pair of small aileron-type fins sticking out like tiny, tiny, tiny pathetic wings, basically the tyrannosaur arm version of wings, on either side of the torpedo. Now, these are actually in place originally, as part of the original design, to help the torpedo sit vertically in the water, not as in nose up, but as in, you know, the torpedo looks like it could swim at any angle. That's not actually true. There is an up and a down and a port and a starboard. And these fins exist to basically, they're gyro controlled to get the torpedo to um, position itself at the correct angle because then it can maneuver because to the torpedoes have two very extensive um, rudders on what should be the, the horizontal plane which are to control its depth, and two much smaller ones on the vertical plane, which are to control its port and starboard characteristics. And of course, if the torpedo, say, lands in such a way that these fins are in an X position, then if the fins that are designed to, the, or if you like, if you use aerial terminology, ailerons that are designed to cause the torpedo to pitch up, i.e. to get to the correct depth to hit a ship, if those activate when the torpedo is at 45 degrees on its side, then it's going to go off to the side and miss. So these little ailerons are there to correct that and make sure the torpedo is vertical. The problem is that although they're gyro controlled and they will stabilize it, if the torpedo goes in having rolled somewhat at an angle, it takes time to get the torpedo on the right um, on, on the right pitch in order for it to then be able to start to rise and stay on target and during that time it's going down and down and down it hits the base of the harbour and then that's it whereas if you add wooden extensions to those as well then you create a control surface that's also large enough to allow this anti-roll mechanism to function while it's in the air so this would mean that the torpedo hits the water already at the at the correct angle of roll, i.e. Its, its up corresponds to actual up, which then means that the torpedo's own elevation and, and dive mechanisms can immediately jam themselves into a position to send the torpedo curving upwards, which will obviously significantly reduce the amount of time it takes for the torpedo to head up to the correct depth, which means it can be dropped into shallower water. And then when you look at accounts from people who are at Pearl Harbor, they describe things like, we were provided with torpedoes fitted with stabilizing fins using gyroscopes. Well, you look at this attachment at the back, that stabilizing fin isn't attached to anything like a gyroscope. Whereas the two little aileron um, anti-roll fins further forward are controlled by a gyroscope. And similarly, um, another uh, person who was uh, an observer on one of the cates in the attack mentions that the wooden fins were attached to the torpedo's existing metal side fins and they acted like wings to adjust up or down on each side of the torpedo to keep it stable in flight. Again, these things on the back are fixed. They don't have any ability to adjust themselves. So it would seem that what they're talking about 
is not these things, the uh, the tail mounted stabilizers, which are there to keep the torpedo pointing in the right direction um, in terms of its forward motion. It would seem that actually, in light of these findings, they are talking about these extensions to the little aileron type um, winglets, which are the anti-roll mechanism for the torpedo, which is controlled by a gyroscope. Richard Goss asks, Hi Drak, with regards to the Third Fleet Dash Channel Fleet in World War One, was it really worth the expenditure of materials and manpower? Excluding the Dardanelles, did they provide good service? How did the Imperial German Navy view the fleet there? So the Channel Fleet at the time was a collection of older vessels, basically pre-dreadnoughts. Um, eventually one or two older dreadnoughts would also be assigned right toward the end of the war. Um, although by that point it wasn't the Channel Fleet anymore. That designation technically only lost, only lost till 1915. But broadly speaking, I think Richard's asking about the collection of Royal Navy warships assigned to defend the Channel, as opposed to the Grand Fleet or the Harwich Force. So you know, broadly speaking, what they existed to do was to defend the Channel, which was not just a gateway to the Atlantic, but it's also vital for the ongoing war effort in World War One because there were men and supplies being shipped to and from France constantly via British ports, as well as, you know, all sorts of other things. And if the Germans could get in and disrupt that, that could be quite a bit of a problem. But the Royal Navy couldn't afford to risk all of its dreadnoughts and battle cruisers being based in the Channel. It was far too easy for submarines to get there, uh, mines to be laid, etc. And obviously also would leave the route north uh, open. So the Grand Fleet and so forth all went up north, and the older ships went south. Now, in terms of was it worth it? Well, they were never fully tested, so we could never know precisely. But as to whether or not um, if they would have been worth it had they been attacked, I mean, it's one of these kind of odd things of, did they deter attack? Um, probably. Because, you know, the Germans definitely would have wanted to get in the channel and wreak havoc if they possibly could. And, of course, the pre-dreadnoughts, they're backed up by cruisers and destroyers and so on and so forth. Now, the idea of the Channel Fleet wasn't that the British were saying, they weren't saying, oh, we've got another fleet that can stand up fully to the high seas fleet. Uh, what it was more about was a kind of a tripwire dash delaying force. Obviously, the Channel is a very narrow, constricted environment, especially around the Straits of Dover. So if the high seas fleet came to try and uh, hit the channel then these older ships would go in to oppose them and between the delaying action that they could fight plus the fact that cruisers and destroyers armed with torpedoes would be far more deadly in a confined environment that would buy time for the Harwich force which had even more cruisers and destroyers to arrive and all of that collectively might either maul the Germans enough that the temporary disruption to the channel uh, might be worth it in terms of lost German ships um, or if the Germans managed to break through, it would delay everything such that if even if the Grand Fleet and the battle cruisers, absent Room 40 intelligence, which probably meant they would have been there first, but if, even if that didn't happen, um, if it then it would delay the Germans long enough that they'd either have to turn back, or if they continued their objective in the Channel, then by the time it was time to turn around and come back home, the Grand Fleet and the battle cruiser fleet would be waiting for them in the Straits of Dover, and then. You know, they'd be forced into into action. And it also meant that the only way you could attack the channel would be by committing the entirety of the high seas fleet or a good enough portion of it that it might as well have made no difference. Because if you sent smaller ships, cruiser formations, the odd armoured cruiser, etc., etc., or some of Germany's few older pre-dreadnoughts, they wouldn't get through even this older ship's barrier. So it kind of put the Germans in an all or nothing position of do you commit the grand the high seas fleet and then it gets either trapped or annihilated by the Grand Fleet, or do you just leave the channel alone? And they leave the channel alone. So in that view, then yes, it's probably definitely worth the expenditure of materials and manpower. And the German Navy, you know, the that deployment was fairly obvious. They knew about it. It's pretty much the reason why they didn't go after the channel. At least with surface ships, they obviously went after it with U-boats. The Rogue Chief asks, If Hornet CV-8 had been taken as a prize by the Japanese at Santa Cruz, 
would the Japanese Navy have had the technical infrastructure or systemic capability to copy her equipment and technology, or even recommission her for Japanese service? I don't think recommissioning Hornet would have been on the cards for, well, two main reasons. One, incompatibility. So the Americans use Imperial and English, the Japanese use Japanese and metric, and it would have been a heck of a job converting all the signs to something that the Japanese crewmen could be familiar with, and you know the other issue of bespoke spare parts and so forth to keep the thing running. Um, that would have been one side of things, uh, but a relatively minor side compared to if they are trying to reverse engineer a bunch of stuff, they would have ripped a bunch of stuff out. Um, so basically, the if they were going to get a captured Hornet back in service with the Japanese fleet, it could be done. They might have thought about trying it towards the end of the war when they were really desperate but it probably would have resembled a you know hornet in name only in that they would have stripped out pretty much all the important stuff to have a look at or at least in parts and then probably just crammed a bunch of machinery back into it of japanese manufacture which admittedly would have been slightly faster than building their own hull um but uh, as you saw with the Unryu class, the Japanese weren't exactly short on hulls. I mean, compared to the Americans they were, but compared to their ability to actually deploy ships, uh, actually having the hulls in the water wasn't the problem. Now, in terms of the other stuff, yeah, there's nothing to say the Japanese couldn't have copied it. Um, I mean, they developed their own radar, but they were just fractionally behind the Americans and the British. You know, they had their own um, turbine and boiler technology, again, a fraction behind, in this case, the Americans with a high-pressure machinery in some ways, and so on and so forth. So, you know, if they have examples to work from and copy from, the infrastructure, for the most part, is there. Hornet has CXAM and SC radar. I'm pretty sure the Japanese could have copied that quite happily. Whether or not they could have then copied that and then got it into mass production enough to distribute through their fleet is another matter entirely, but you know, resource shortage and scaling factors are very different from the ability to just manufacture the sets in the first place, perhaps at least for installation on their presti more prestigious ships. John Grabard asks, is it appropriate to credit the I-19 with the most effective single torpedo salvo in history? carrier and a destroyer sunk and a battleship significantly damaged now you can obviously get into endless debates as with a lot of things in naval history as to how precisely you calculate most effective is it number of tons sunk in a single salvo um, is it effect on the immediate campaign is it effect on the immediate battle is it effect on the larger strategic perspective etc 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 and so on because you, know, you could torpedo one ship, um, even a relatively speaking smaller vessel, but if that deters your enemy from entering a bay or a strait or participating further in a, in a battle or makes your enemy turn away from a battle and so forth, um, then, you know, how effective is that? The problem is it's non-quantifiable. You could argue in some ways that perhaps the torpedoes that were fired by the high seas fleet to cover the their initial turn away are the most effective single torpedo salvo in history because it prevented the ground fleet from chasing them down and hammering them in daylight but if you go by the more common metric which is you know basically number of enemy ships knocked out of action then yeah i think pretty much i19 is the the top scorer because whilst north carolina obviously survived she was out of action for repairs for a while and other than that, bagged a small fleet carrier and a destroyer, all with just one spread of torpedoes. There's precious little you can point to that managed to accomplish anything on that scale. Matt Kidd asks, did German U-boat commanders know that they were being located with HFDF? And did they take countermeasures like dummy nonsense transmissions that looked like legit U-boat communications? Initially, no, they didn't have any idea because HFDF or HuffDuff is an entirely passive system. Um, as the war went on, things began to change. The German high command began to suspect that this was what was happening and U-boats were informed about that. So they were basically told, you need to keep your transmissions um, short to the point, to try and minimise them. The problem was that the whole German U-boat method of warfare for a good chunk of World War II also relied on relatively frequent communication with and from U-boats, which, you know, those two things kind of run at odds with each other if you have to talk to them all the time but also you can't talk to them too much 
Um, so, yeah, it, mid to late part of the war, the German U-boat commanders knew there was a risk of being triangulated with Haftaf, but they didn't know if any given particular transmission had been intercepted or not. Um, the problem with countermeasures like dummy nonsense transmissions is that actually Haftaf doesn't care what you're transmitting. All it cares is that you are. Um, it's a bit like uh, Korn, the blood god of electronic transmissions. It cares not from whence the transmissions flow, only that they flow. Um, because the point of Haftaf is, you know, there's a transmission, we can triangulate on it from different uh, receptors and work out where it sources. So whether the U-boat is sending out an actual position report, convoy spotting report, or the first few stanzas to Deutschland, Deutschland, Uber Alles, really makes little difference to a Haftaf transmitter. Um, in theory, you could maybe try for aircraft making U-boat communications, like send out condors to make false reports, or you could have some kind of uh, decoy system set up. The problem is any decoy that's carrying a radio big enough and powerful enough with enough power, of course, to start making transmissions that would reach the coast of France and therefore also reach half transmission transmitters, that's going to be a fairly big and expensive piece of kit, which you probably don't want to use huge numbers of. And of course, um, a condor that effectively transmits its location, A, potentially could be intercepted itself, and B, if it's a transmission of any particular length, the fact that the condor is moving at several hundred miles an hour will probably show up, especially on um, half-duff receivers that are mounted on ships much closer to it rather than perhaps shore-based stations. So it would be much less effective. Uh, there's one of the wonderful things about frequency triangulation is that there's actually relatively few countermeasures other than just don't transmit or transmit on frequency that they can't detect. Max asks, regarding Operation Pedestal and other convoy operations, one of the main weaknesses seems to me the slow speed and lack of protection of merchant ships. Were there any plans to build a transport with the speed to keep up with the escorts and protection to protect it from bomb near misses or torpedoes? And additionally, were there plans to convert existing ships, for example, ripping out the main armament of a cruiser and putting stores in its place? So this is kind of similar to a question from a previous dry dock relatively recently, but Fundamentally, the problem with fast transports is, compared to the slower transports um, that are most commonly used in convoys, basically the faster you make the ship, the more expensive it gets, and the less space proportional to its overall hull volume you have to store cargo. The only way you can make such a ship profitable in peacetime or able to carry enough resources to make it worth building in the first place in wartime is to make it exceptionally large which then increases the expense still further and you end up in this upward spiral uh, and then that's before you start slapping things like protective systems and armor on it which are also going to make it heavier more expensive um, again especially with torpedo defenses much less volume in the hull for ca carrying cargo so you're going to end up if you did build them with some very very large relatively fast but also incredibly valuable transports that still can't outrun bomb, bombs or torpedoes. Look at the number of sunken warships as a testament to that. Yes, it will be slightly less vulnerable than your average transport, and crucially, due to their speed, they'll be less vulnerable. They well, they'll be vulnerable for far less time. Um, but the amount of money that, and uh, risk that would go into putting basically all your eggs in very very few baskets would be immense to the point that, yeah, you might build half a dozen of these things, but losing one of them could be utterly devastating and you know, can't be replaced. Whereas if you're using Liberty ships and Victory ships, obviously you don't want to use uh, to lose a bunch of um, ships. But if you have a convoy of 30 ships and three of them get torpedoed, and in the time it's taken that convoy to cross the Atlantic, you've built seven Liberty ships... Overall, you still have ships to pack supplies in as long as the supplies are there to be put on the ships. Whereas if you have, say, half a dozen or a dozen very big, heavily protected, fast transport ships and you send them onto something like Pedestal, if the Italians or Flieger Corp 10 manage to nab one or two, you only have four or five left. And that's it, period. Um, you're not going to get another one anytime soon. And any ship that was already 
armed cruiser or whatever is far too valuable at that point to disarm. However, the flip side to that is that occasionally if there was a relatively low volume, high value cargo, usually troops, but sometimes other specialist equipment, those would be stuck on some very, very fast, well defended ships things like the Abdiel class mine layers or HMS Gloucester at various points, uh, town class cruiser. And then they would make the run at full warship speed, obviously with their own full warship protection. And especially the Abdiels, they could actually risk making the run into the worst of the Italian and German controlled areas at night and actually get under the guns of Malta safely by morning. Um, although it obviously it did incur some other risks as well. John McDonough asks, are the records for HMS Glorious, the only aircraft carrier loss records that are sealed for a hundred years, and how muddy are the facts relating to that event? As far as I'm aware, yes, they are the only records with relation to the loss of a carrier that we're not going to see the full materials of for at least, what, another 15 or so years? Um, there are some carriers whose loss records are sparser, but that's because those records were physically destroyed usually by fire or something like that usually a lot of japanese stuff um now as far as how muddy everything is there is there's a fair amount of conjecture around why glorious was lost the conventional tagline being that you know she was detached um from the convoy that was heading back from norway to proceed back to the uk um possibly because she was short of fuel and this was a more efficient route for her to go. You know, she was caught by Scharnhorst and Kneisenau and sunk. Um, there's, it is known, and it's a fact, that the captain of Glorious had put uh, he, the head of aircraft operations on Glorious ashore for refusing to take part uh, in operations that he had um, he'd said he, he wanted to do. And, you know, there there is some indication in some records that he was heading back in order to uh, court-martial him, although there's also potentially indications that this may have been just, a, you know, by way of an excuse for sailing home rather than specifically actually what he wanted to do. Um, again, with the ship's logs lost and with no senior staff surviving, it's very difficult to work out exactly what was going on in the last 24 to 48 hours aboard Glorious. Um, then you have Operation Paul, uh, of which bits are known, but exactly what Glorious's role was or wasn't going to be in it, it's all um, up in the air. And this is this is the bit that people usually point to and say, well, if we could get access to these records, these ones that are sealed till 2041, then we might know more. Uh, and be able to definitively put it down because the thing is operation paul the plan to mine swedish ports in order to stop iron ore uh, exports that much is known it was a plan um but it was originally a plan to use lots of carriers and then the last official correspondence is talking about using arc royal for it but arc royal was still with the returning convoy and by the time she got home, not only had Glorious been sunk, but the been sunk, but the entire operation had been called off. The conjecture then says, well, maybe actually Glorious was detached um, and ordered to proceed back at pace so that she could get refitted for Operation Paul because someone had realised that Ark Royal was the more valuable of the two ships, and the Germans by this point were aware that the British were evacuating from Norway. But this is where we cross over from things that we can prove via signal to speculation and yeah so exactly why glorious left the convoy to proceed at speed on her own just with a cast and ardent is something that definitively we can't say until 2041 when those records are released but unofficially something odd seems to be up um i'm not necessarily prepared to commit myself in 100 entirely to the idea that she was being summoned back to take to be quickly refitted to take part in 
uh, mining operation against the Swedes, because apart from anything, the, the, the single biggest flaw to that theory, in my estimation, is that if she had not been intercepted, if she'd managed to get back to the UK, then a loaded, newly converted swordfish with extended range fuel tanks, then sailed all the way back to Sweden, that would have taken from the point at which she was sunk on the 8th of June, probably at least three to four days, possibly even a week, depends how quickly the aircraft could be converted. Just the simple journey time itself would have been two to three days. Um, by which point the Germans would have been present in the area in considerable strength. At, and so even using an older carrier it would have been utterly suicidal to do so which can't have escaped Royal Navy planners, which then makes me hesitate to say that that's actually what they wanted to do because it would be so self-evidently destructive. And yes, therefore, I'm I'm a little bit on the edge of things and I'm reserved judgment until such time as we have all the documents available to us, whenever that is. But the, uh, yeah, the fact that those documents were sealed in the first place in and of itself puts a little bit of a a marker over you know, what exactly is there to hide because there's an awful lot of stuff that's come out both positive and negative from world war ii like you know the entirety existence of bletchley park which you know as far as war affecting things as concerned is considerably more than anything that could have been done with glorious and that wasn't sealed for 100 years jeffrey Connolly says or asks, Civil War Admiral David Farragut is remembered for his order at the Battle of Mobile Bay, which is said to have been damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. What does that mean? Uh, also, how good an admiral would you consider him to be? So the phrase damn the torpedoes full speed ahead, I mean, it's a shortened version of what he probably actually said. But at the time, mines were known as torpedoes um, and there was a Confederate minefield in the area. Um, mines having been deployed, obviously, in the Crimean War the decade earlier. And he was basically told, you know, well, he saw that the fleet was slowing down. He was asked why, and he was told, well, there's a minefield ahead, i.e. there's torpedoes ahead. And his response was basically, I don't care, go go ahead all, <laughs> all speed. Um, funnily enough, as it turns out, the ship that probably was the reason for him making the inquiries in the first place was the Tecumseh, uh, Canonicus class monitor, which had slowed down because of the torpedoes it proceeded anyway and actually i say ironically enough that hit a torpedo and sank incredibly quickly because one thing that monitors weren't was mine proof because small heavy low freeboard blow a hole in the bottom and that's pretty much it for them um in any case farragut still won now looking in overall terms um of his command record Farragut, I think, is a good enough admiral. He had the potential to be a very good admiral in certain wars, but perhaps was not the best admiral to have in the kind of war the Union was fighting, um, assaulting lots of coastal fortifications. Because if you look at his overall war record, obviously the Battle of Mobile Bay, where this saying comes from, was a huge success. Um, he pressed on through the enemy against some very heavily defended um, Confederate positions and carried the day. However, this seems to have been his general tactic. If you look at his what he did in previous battles, he generally would take whatever ships he'd been assigned and he would run them at the enemy as quickly and as aggressively as possible. Now, that is actually a very you know, Nelsonian-style thing to do. And I think in open sea warfare, where you trust your ships and your men that would potentially make him a very successful admiral. The only problem is that um, in the sea, or in the open ocean, I should say, you do have room to manoeuvre, you have room to correct for mistakes, and it's easier to see issues coming. Whereas if you're running up rivers and into harbours um, with close-range shore fortifications and gun batteries, it's much harder to work out what exactly is going on um, and what might then happen to you. And at in at least two of his operations prior to Mobile Bay, his forces were actually forced to withdraw after having pushed forward very aggressively 
but then been hit by either Confederate ironclads or Confederate shore batteries. If you give him the correct uh, tools for dealing with that situation, i.e. a fleet of monitors uh, and a few other vessels, then sure, you know, Farragut's tactics can bull straight through, um, albeit with the loss of one of the uh, more recent US monitors that comes as mentioned earlier. Um, but uh, it, it does suggest that perhaps Farragut had plenty of aggression, but maybe not quite the level of appreciation for coastal assault operations that would be desired in that particular war. Whereas, say, if you... I mean, Farragut did take part in the War of 1812 as a boy, but if Farragut, at his age in uh, the, the U.S. Civil War, had been teleported back in time to the War of 1812, his aggressive command style would have served him an awful lot better as a frigate captain, um, at least as long as he didn't come across a ship of the line and try and take that on. And that brings us to the conclusion of this episode of The Dry Dock. Thank you very much for listening. Um, for those of you who I'm going to see up at Fight Camp, um, that's Matt Easton's Historical European Martial Arts uh, annual event. Well, hello dash in advance or retrospective hello, because considering it's running from Friday through to Sunday, I might already have met you. Um, but uh, for those of you who aren't aware of that, the if you're interested in HEMA, it's definitely a thing to come and uh, have a look at if you can. Obviously, this year is already uh, booked out, and by the time you're listening to this, is already underway, but maybe next year. Um, and in more naval-related matters, um, things continue to be relatively calm over here at Castle Drac, and uh, hopefully service throughout August will be nice and smooth. So thanks very much, and uh, see you again in another episode. <laughs>